much, Tom. Uh, thank you, Angela. Uh, so thank you also to uh, um, Joe Ferrara, for, who's the CSO for Rogaku, for um, inviting me to give a talk today. Uh, thanks again to Angela for hosting, and thank you to all of you who are attending. Um, it's very excited to present some of the work that we've done as part of a large structural genomics organization on um, phasing using uh, iodide ions and data collected in-house. Uh, so as for the overview, uh, I will first give a one-slide background on the Seattle Structural Genomics Center for Infectious Disease, uh, SSGCID. So that will give you a framework for the work that, we, uh, that I'll be presenting today. Uh, then I will go through a few slides uh, with a very brief overview of structure determination using crystallography. And so this is to put what we're doing in the context of the big picture for uh, people who are perhaps newer to crystallography. Um, and then I'll head into the bulk of the talk, which is sad phasing using iodide ions. And that will have three different sections. Uh, the first one will be a workflow. I'll describe the technique in general. Uh, that will then be followed by an overview of the results that we've had for SSGCID. And uh, I will then head into three different case studies to walk you through the different steps uh, that were needed for successful structure determination in those three cases. Uh, so, in general, uh, all of this work was done as part of the SSGCID, uh, which is a um, structural genomics effort funded by the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAID. And so, this was awarded to Seattle Biomed with Peter Myler as the main PI. Uh, and in addition, there are a bunch of other groups that are involved in this. There are two groups at the University of Washington, Gab Verani's lab, which is an NMR group, and um, Wes Van Voris's lab of the protein production and cloning. Uh, all of the crystallography is done at Emerald Biostructures, where I work, and uh, there is another group uh, of Barry, Gary Buchko at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So all of these groups are within Washington State. Uh, the purpose of SSGCID is to generate a blueprint uh, for structure-guided drug design against infectious disease organisms. And these are organisms selected by the NIAID, uh, which include class A through C organisms with an emphasis on emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. Now, most of the targets uh, we select um, uh, have, are selected because of their function. They have an assess, essential function, although some of the targets are selected have an unknown function but appear to be conserved genes. And there's quite a number of ways that we select things, but that gives you a general idea. Uh, in addition, we accept requests from the scientific community for different targets, and um, there's a wide range of targets that are uh, requested by the community. Now, the goal is to determine 75 to 100 structures per year over five years. Uh, you can see the list of organisms uh, that we're looking at uh, in the lower left. Uh, these include bacterial, fungal, eukaryotic organisms, as well as viruses. And um, as part of a large publicly funded structural genomics project, uh, we uh, make all of our materials available to the scientific community. So all of our targets are deposited into, into target DB. All of our plasmids go to the BEI repository. So if you want a, one of our plasmids, you can go there and get one. Um, all of our protein samples that we have left over uh, are available through SSGCID. All of our X-ray uh, diffraction images, all of our raw diffraction images are available through the CSGID website. Uh, so the CSGID is a second center uh, that was funded by the NIAID for infectious disease, and that's the Center for Structural Genomics of Infectious Diseases. And all of our structures, of course, get deposited into the PDB, and we try to make most or all of our publications 
when possible, open access. So pretty much everything we do goes into the public domain. So like just about everybody else in the field of crystallography, we go through uh, the standard series of steps that need to be done to be successful to determine structures. Uh, so we start off with uh, target selection, construct design, cloning, and move into expression and purification, crystallization, data collection, phasing, and then the output is, of course, our crystal structures. So for people outside of the field of crystallography, this phasing step um, appears to be something like magic. Of course, it's not magic, it's uh, math. And so if you look at any of the general uh, crystallography textbooks, you'll see this equation or some version of it. And so in X-ray crystallography, what we actually measure in our diffraction images are the location of our reflections, or H, K, and L, which gives us our unit cell, or point group, and point group. And we can also measure the intensity of the reflections, and that gives us uh, what is actually inside the unit cell. Uh, so in order to solve this equation, though, we need also phi. And for small molecules and ultra-high resolution macromolecules, phi can be measured directly. This is called direct methods. And, uh, but generally speaking, for macromolecules, we cannot measure phi directly. And this is what is colloquially referred to as the phase problem. So in order to determine the phases, solve this equation, and solve our structures, we can use one of several different kinds of methods. And I've divided them into two different categories, molecular replacement, which I'll talk briefly on in the next slide, and then de novo phase information. Uh, determination, which is the focus of the talk today. So in molecular replacement, this relies on a known homologous structure. So this could be a crystal structure in the PDB, an NMR structure, uh, a structure generated in, a model I should say, generated in silico uh, using programs like Rosetta. It could also be um, idealized A-form RNA uh, that can be generated in CUBED. And in molecular replacement, you use one of a variety of different uh, software programs. And these programs try to take the search model and then to fit it to the data using uh, rotation and translation until it can fit what it believes is a good uh, solution. And it also, these programs also, of course, looking at packing within the crystal lattice. And once a solution is found, um, one generates phases based on the model. Um, and our chances for success using this uh, technique are generally above 50% if we're starting off with a homologous structure that contains about 50% sequence identity. Um, if the homologous structure has between 30 and 50% sequence identity, it's fairly likely, not always, but you have a pretty good chance of solving the structure. And if you're below 30% sequence identity, it's pretty unlikely that you'll solve the structure. Of course, it's not sequence identity that determines our ability to solve things by molecular replacement, but the um, differences in the structure of the search model versus the target protein. Um, those can, of course, be calculated with a root mean square deviation, but um, we don't know that beforehand, before we solve the structure. So people typically look at sequence identity. Now, if molecular replacement isn't possible uh, or doesn't work, of course, we need to determine the phases. Um, and so there are a, several different experiments that can be performed, uh, almost all of which require adding a heavy atom to the protein sample to create anomalous uh, sites. Um, which are useful for orienting phi. Uh, and these fall into basic, two basic categories. One is called isomorphous replacement, in which a, uh, one examines differences between a native data set and a derivative data set. So uh, these, this technique requ requires that the native and the derivative data sets be isomorphous, and basically that they be the same, except for the one piece, which is the derivative, which is different. This can be done as single isomorphous replacement, or SIR, or with uh, multiple derivatives, MIR. Uh, one can also add in an anomalous scattering component if the derivative heavy atoms uh, have that in 
This can be done, of course, in Cyrus or Myris fashion. Uh, however, most structures these days are determined um, using de novo phases of anomalous dispersion. So this comes in two different ways, uh, single wavelength anomalous dispersion, or SAD, or multi-wavelength anomalous dispersion, or MAD. And so what is anomalous signal? Well, in crystallography, we have Friedel's law, which states that the intensities of symmetry-related reflections are the same. So I of HKL in a two-fold symmetry would give you uh, the same intensity of the minus H minus K minus L. Of course, as I said before, intensities are what we measure. However, uh, some heavy atoms absorb X-rays at specific wavelengths, and this creates a situation where Friedel's law is not true. So Friedel's law is false. Symmetry-related reflections do not have the same intensity. And so we can measure the difference in these Friedel mates, which are somewhere on the order of 3% of the intensity. And this gives us our anomalous signal. And then we can use the anomalous signal to locate the sites within the lattice to solve the phase problem. So how does this fit within uh, a large structural genomics project? Um, we, uh, well, uh, we actually expect most of our structures to be solved by molecular replacement. Uh, indeed, 315 PDB entries have been deposited that are, have been solved by X-ray. We have another 16 by NMR. And of those 315 PDB entries, 92% of them have been solved by molecular replacement. And so knowing going into uh, our work that most of our targets are going to be solved by molecular replacement, uh, all of our proteins are expressed in native form. However, uh, of course, not all structures do solve by molecular replacement, and this necess necessitates de novo structure determination. And so we wanted to develop a strategy for solving structures um, where molecular replacement failed or was not possible. We could have gone with the standard method these days of selenomethionine labeling, However, uh, as I said, all of our proteins were expressed in native form. Uh, so in order to go, once we got diffraction quality crystals, in order to go back and generate selenomethionine labeled protein, it would be several months before we would have diffraction quality crystals again. So we wanted to expedite the process by using uh, a phasing strategy uh, that allowed us to utilize our, the native crystals that we already have on hand. Uh, we wanted a technique that used non-toxic compounds. Um, I don't like working with mercury, so I didn't want to use that. Um, we wanted the technique to be applicable to uh, a high-throughput environment. We wanted to have rapid access to our data, so preferably uh, collect data in-house on rotating, wave, uh, rotating anode wavelengths. And, of course, we wanted it to be successful across a wide range of proteins. Since, as I said before, we're using uh, a huge number of proteins, and these are from bacteria, fungi, and um, viruses, and eukaryotes. So the technique that we decided to use was sad phasing using iodide ions. This is one that my coworker, Jan Abendroth, had uh, used successfully as a postdoc. This has been described in the literature quite well by uh, Doubter and colleagues in some nice papers uh, about 11 years ago, and a few more recently. And also, uh, Amit Sharma's lab has had quite a number of successful cases where they're able to use iodide ions. Now, both of these groups, uh, Doubter and Sharma, predicted that uh, this technique would be applicable to high-throughput crystallography groups and structural genomics as well. And so we applied this uh, technique uh, starting in the uh, fall of 2009 and had quite a bit of success. And so a little bit earlier this year, we published our results to date at that point in the Journal of Structural and Functional Genomics, uh, where Jan Abendorf is the first author. And I just wanted to highlight one related publication. Um, so everything of the top publications are iodide ions, but in a related uh, strategy is to use the magic triangle, which is a triiodobenzene compound shown here. And the citation for that 
is Beck and all from a few years ago. So the iodide ion sad phasing has four general steps. So in the first step, one takes the native crystals that um, you've optimized for diffraction, and you soak them into a solution containing high concentrations of iodide ions. In the next step, you collect data in-house, uh, typically, uh, but you want it to be where the anomalous signal is strong. So, of course, one could also collect at the synchrotron, uh, preferably at a tunable wavelength beamline, where you could dial down um, the energy to a, a longer wavelength, where uh, iodides have larger anomalous signal. In the third step, one locates the anomalous sites. Um, I will use the term sites for today's talk. Anomalous scatterers is probably more accurate, uh, but I'll just use the word sites. And in the fourth step, uh, one estimates the phases using a SAD experiment. Now, I want to stress that all of these steps are iterative. Um, very few of our cases for the 20 or so that we've solved uh, go through in a linear, linear fashion and work the first time. In many, in almost all of the cases, we have to repeat one or more step until we are able to solve the structure. So in the first step, uh, after you've already obtained your high quality diffraction native crystals, you then prepare a new stock solution which contains your crystallization conditions. Uh, it also contains iodide ions and uh, Typically, I also like to include the cryoprotection reagent if necessary. And so we've had success between 0.2 and 1.0 molar iodide. Um, now, iodide stock solutions can be made at 5 molar or higher for both sodium iodide and potassium iodide. Um, so going up to high concentrations uh, is really generally not a problem for most crystallization conditions. Um, once you prepare the new stock solution, you harvest your crystals and into the new stock solution, and then you soak it for a short period of time. Typically, one to five minutes is sufficient, um, although um, oftentimes we've also done up to one hour of soak time, um, and most of our crystals seem to tolerate this. Then the next step, of course, is to vitrify for cryocrystallography. So I'm going to walk you through a couple different examples of soaking. The first one is a community request target, the histidine kinase periplasmic domain uh, sensor protein, it's a pH sensor protein, and, uh, from Burkhold area pseudomalli, which is a causative reagent of myelidosis. Uh, the crystals grew in the JCSG screen in the presence of 0.2 molar lithium sulfate, uh, 0.1 molar phosphate citrate buffer at pH 4.2, and 25% uh, PEG 1000. So we soaked this into a solution containing one molar potassium iodide, the same buffer, and we uh, boosted up the PEG concentration slightly to improve our chances at cryoprotection. So we did this soak for one hour. Um, shorter times may have been sufficient, but we, we started off with one hour, and it worked the first time. In another case, uh, which is a bol a like protein from the Bicia bovis, uh, and this is actually the first crystal structure of a bol a like protein. Several NMR structures had been solved previously. Uh, in this case, the crystals grew in 0.2 molar sodium chloride with 0.1 molar sodium cacodylate, pH 6.5, and um, uh, two molar ammonium sulfate. I, I see that I missed a question in the chat window, sorry about that, at, uh, which the question was what wavelength one collects the iodide ion uh, soak data. Uh, we typically use, I'll get to that in the next, um, a little bit short, but we typically use our rotating anode, which is 1.54, 1 1.8 1 angstroms, uh, and copper K alpha. Um, so for the Bicia bovis example, uh, for iodide soaking, we first tried to soak it into a solution that contained one molar iodide ions, uh, the same buffer, and also replacing some of the ammonium sulfate with lithium sulfate. However, the crystals visibly cracked when we looked at them under the microscope, and uh, on the diffractometer, they diffracted quite poorly. So then for th this case to be successful, we needed to go back and repeat the soaking steps, uh, and this time we did a step uh, soaking and cryo, where uh, we used four different steps at five minutes each. 
uh, starting off with 100 millimolar sodium iodide, then 200, 500, and 1 molar. And at the same time, we decreased the ammonium sulfate concentration while gradually increasing the lithium sulfate. So that was what was successful in that case. Uh, in another case, which uh, quite frankly astonished me that it worked, was a crystal of a trimeric autotransporter adhesin, uh, again a, a community request target. This crystal grew in the presence of 0.2 molar uh, zinc chloride and 0.1 molar sodium cacodylate and 6% isopropanol. So no PEG, no MPD, no ammonium sulfate. Um, very wet crystallization conditions, if you will. And we only had one crystal in this condition, so I had one chance for success, uh, and I got it to work. Uh, so I soaked it into a solution containing 0.7 molar sodium iodide, uh, the same zinc chloride, same buffer, the same concentration of isopropanol, and 22% ethylene glycol as cryoprotectant. Now, it was pretty clear when I put the crystal into this stock solution for soaking that the isopropanol was off-gassing pretty quickly. Um, you could see that by the fact that the crystal was basically dancing all over the well. Um, but after about one minute of soaking, I harvested it and was able to get a very nice data set and, uh, to 2.5 angstrom resolution and structure. So uh, in the second step, data collection. Okay, so another question. In Babo, uh, was one molar lithium sulfate used as a cryoprotectant? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, okay, so uh, on to step two, data collection. Uh, in this step, one wants to, you need to make sure that you get the most out of your data. Um, you want to get the best anomalous signal you can in order to be able to solve a structure. Now, uh, there's quite a number of resources out there in the literature uh, that describe strategies for data collection. So I'm not going to go into it too much, uh, but I will point out John Rose's Rogaku webinar uh, from about a year and a half ago on the practical aspects of SAD data collection. He went through quite a number of slides on uh, strategies for uh, proper data collection of SAD experiments, uh, especially in-house. And there's another nice uh, article by Doubter in uh, Actacris D, the April issue of 2010, on carrying out an optimal experiment. Uh, this, this issue of Actacris D is actually an excellent issue. There's a, quite a number of review articles that are there uh, for general purpose crystallography. Uh, many excellent papers. Um, so that's a good resource to have for crystallographers. Uh, so, uh, but for the current experiment of SAD data using iodide ion soaks, uh, we collect almost all of our data at copper K alpha, so rotating anode wavelengths in-house. Uh, at this wavelength, uh, iodide ions have a very strong anomalous signal of 6.9 uh, for the F double prime. Uh, although, uh, if one were to use a chromium rotating anode, the anomalous signal would be almost twice that. We don't have a chromium anode here, but we use copper um, rotating anode. So all of the structures that I'll be talking about were collected at copper um, K-alpha. We've also been putting a little bit of work into examining things at synchrotron radiation as well, uh, but I'm not ready to talk about that yet. Um, so iodide has a pretty strong signal at copper K-alpha, 6.9. That's about twice what selenium has at its edge at synchrotron radiation, so just to give you a an idea of where, how they compare. So also for the second step, data collection, uh, one needs to, uh, we typically collect 360 degrees of data in-house, um, and we haven't observed any significant radiation damage in any of our crystals. The general idea there, of course, is that by measuring reflections multiple times, the error in the measurement of the anomalous signal may be minimized. Uh, we reduce our data in XDS and X scale with the Friedel setting on false. Uh, so I'll just give a disclaimer now that throughout the talk, I'll be describing what we do and the programs that we use. Um, of course, there's many crystallography programs out there available for use, and um, I encourage everyone to try as many programs as possible. Uh, and so in XDS, X scale, 
what you want to look at in terms of examining the data for the strength of the anomalous signal are two columns, which are the anomalous correlation column and the sig anno column. Uh, and so what you want to see here is for the anomalous correlation, you want this number to be a high percentage in the low resolution bins, and you'll typically see this fade out to higher resolution. I typically like to cut the data where the anomalous correlation fades to somewhere in the order of 10% in the highest resolution bin, um, and that corresponds to a sig anno value typically of about 0 0.9. Um, so that's about what you want to see for your data. Uh, it's good to see uh, values of sig anno above 3 or so in the lowest resolution bin. Uh, so for these numbers overall in the data set, I like to see the anomalous correlation above 32 or about above 30 percent and the sig anno typically above somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.3. Uh, so if you collect a data set and you see that your anomalous signal is lower than these values, I would um, suggest trying the structural solution, um, but it, it, if it doesn't work, to go back and, and try to do this, repeat the soaking step, uh, preferably with higher concentrations of iodide ions and or for longer periods of time, collect a new data set and see if you have a stronger anomalous signal. Uh, so in the third step, one then needs to locate the anomalous scatterers or sites. Uh, we use phoenix.his to do this or shellx um, suite to locate our sites. Uh, now, in this step, the selection of the resolution range can have an effect on your ability to identify sites and to solve the structure. We've seen this in a few cases. We've also seen this reported in the literature. And the makers of the program ShellX uh, suggest cutting the resolution to three to three and a half angstroms resolution for looking for the anomalous sites. Now with selenomethionine labeling and SAD or MAD um, structure determination, you know the number of methionine residues that go into the protein sequence, so you should have a good, num a good idea of the number of methionines in your data set. However, that's not the same for iodide ion soaks. The number of sites isn't known a priori, and so this step is very much an iterative process uh, where one needs to try to converge upon a, a correct number of sites. The closer you are to the correct number of sites, the better your chances of solving the structure. So I suggest starting with one site per 20 amino acids of the projected scattering mass, um, and then adjusting that number up or down depending on your, uh, the results from the um, location experiment. In some cases, which I'll get to uh, later as one of the case studies, it's good to limit the number of sites that you look for. Um, but in other cases where you have a large unit cell, uh, we typically need to overpredict the number of sites. Uh, so starting with one iodide per 10 amino acids of scattering mass in order to obtain a reasonable number of sites. And the reason for this is that the programs look for sites uh, through multiple different runs and compare them, and then it looks for the sites that have been repeated. So, uh, for example, in uh, PDB entry 3PFD, uh, there was over 100 iodide sites, uh, over 100 iodides modeled in the final structure, and these all had uh, a, a pretty strong anomalous signal. So if you looked at anomalous difference Fourier maps, you would see that these have uh, signal above five sigma, so they're all quite strong. Um, and so if you challenged the programs to only find 10 sites, uh, the chances that they'll find the 10 sites out of 100 sites uh, through multiple runs is going to be pretty low. So in this case, you need to overpredict the, or try to overpredict the number of sites. Of course, um, the program takes much longer to run if you are asking it to find more sites. So if you ask the programs to find, you know, four or five sites, It'll probably take a couple minutes, but if you ask the programs to take to, to find 100 sites, uh, it, they'll often take several hours. Um, so uh, we often start with a lower number and uh, do multiple runs at the same time and then see how we are in the next step, which is the SAD experiment. 
So again, uh, there's a number of programs available for use. Uh, we typically use Phaser EP and also Phoenix. And after you've run your experiment, what you want to look for is the figure of merit and also the number of sites that get output from the uh, SAD run. The next thing I do is density modification. Uh, again, there's a number of programs. We use Parrot. And after density modification, I typically put the uh, and TZ file output straight into Buccaneer with the desired sequence. Uh, I like Buccaneer as an automated building program because it's fast. Uh, at the same time that I have Buccaneer running in the background, I then go over to Coot and look at my density modified maps. And what I want to look for in this case are solvent channels, protein density uh, that has interpretable features such as alpha helices and beta stored sheets. And I also want to look at the anomalous signal. Uh, in this example, it's shown as in uh, yellow mesh. And I want to make sure that that correlates with the sites that are being output from the SAT experiment. So for example, on the left, you can see what the maps looked like. And then uh, after I was able to examine the maps, the Buccaneer was finished running, and so I just open up the Buccaneer model, and you can see it fits quite well here with an alpha helix, and so on and so forth. Um, Buccaneer will, of course, build your uh, selenomethionine residues for you, uh, but it doesn't build iodine sites, so you need to build those in manually after the fact. At least as far as I know, it won't build the sites in for you. Okay, so it, also as part of this experiment, uh, the SAD experiment, if you have a molecular replacement solution that is weak but plausible, you can plug that in in whichever program you're using, such as Phaser EP. So you can input both the anomalous sites and the partial MR solution. This is often quite useful for orienting the um, enantiomorphs. So it, in SAD alone, it's often very important to look at both enantiomorphs or enantiomorphic space groups, for example. P6 sub 122 versus P6 sub 522, for example. Uh, and the output from a SAD experiment combined with molecular replacement is often quite um, considerably better than either of the two experiments alone. And so again, in that April issue from last year of Actacris D, there's a very nice paper that describes uh, combining SAD and MR uh, in phases, how two wrongs can make some, sometimes make a right. Um, and we've solved six SSGCID targets using combined iodide ion SAD with MR. So to recap the workflow for uh, SAD phasing using iodide ions, there's four steps. Uh, in the first step, I like to start with soaking at one molar uh, iodide concentrations and adding in the cryoprotectant also at the same time and doing one to two minute soaks. Um, it's, if at this stage, again, your crystals get damaged, then I, I go back and um, try different conditions. But I like to start off with one molar uh, iodide ions and the cryoprotection already in there. In the second step for data collection, we collect 360 degrees in-house and examine the data. Again, these are the general statistics that you want to look for in your data. In the third step, uh, it can be influential to cut your resolution to lower resolution for looking at the sites, typically 2.5 or 3 angstrom resolution. And uh, it's also important to start with uh, um, one iodide per 20 amino acids of the projected scattering mass and adjust this number up or down uh, examining sites for 50% occupancy. Uh, so the question uh, has been asked in the chat window of what's your take on structures with pseudosymmetry problem? Um, I've had a, a few cases that have pseudotranslational symmetry, um, and it's something that's very, very challenging to overcome. Uh, I've also talked with John Hunt um, about this, who's a director of another structural genomics project, and, uh, and with other crystallographers. And with pseudotranslational symmetry, um, the best answer that most people come up with is get a new crystal form. Um, that's not a very helpful uh, 
response, of course, so sorry about that, but it's what um, it's the only thing that I've had any success on for cases that have strong pseudo-translational symmetry. Okay, so another question is, what's the low resolution where one can successfully use this phasing tech method? Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit with our number of, with our examples from SSGCID. Uh, but the lowest resolution that we've had successful phasing in is 2.95 angstroms. That's um, fairly low. Okay, so also to recap the workflow uh, for the SAT experiment in step four, um, it's important to include both enantiomorphs where applicable, and also sometimes if you have a weak or partial uh, molecular replacement solution that is known, that can be included in, and can often give you better phases than the SAT experiment alone. Okay, so now I'll move into the application of SAD phasing using iodide ions to SSGCID, now that I've gone over the general method and the workflow. And so over the past 20 or so months, we have used this technique in a large structured genomics project. We've applied it to about 20 targets that fail molecular replacement, and we've described our results in a 2001 paper in the Journal of Structural Functional Genomics, where Jan Abendroth was the first author. Uh, so here is a list. It's not complete, uh, but it's most of the proteins um, that we've solved. Uh, and you can see that they come from quite a number of different organisms, um, bacterial organisms, uh, fungi such as coccidioides, and also uh, eukaryotes as well. But you can see that we've had success with quite a range of different protein types um, from this ortholog of RB. Oops. Uh, 0543, which will be my first uh, case study. That's a putative uncharacterized protein. And you can see that there's quite a range of different uh, protein functions. Now here is the phasing resolution. Uh, in some cases, we had a higher resolution native data set, but this is the actual phasing resolution. So you can see that this ranged from 1.9 angstrom resolution uh, down to 2.95 angstrom resolution. This is also successful across a wide range of space groups, uh, from low symmetry to high symmetry, also uh, from uh, structures or data sets that had small unit cell size, uh, where there was only 90 amino acids in the asymmetric unit, up to um, data sets that had over 1,500 amino acids in the asymmetric unit. Now, our figure of merits generally ranged from 0.3 to 0.5, um, and Two-thirds of the cases were solved by SAD phasing, and one-third was solved by combining SAD with MR. And you can see the different iodide ion concentrations here. And again, these are all in the paper, except for the most recent cases. And so many of them were one molar uh, iodide solutions, although some were certainly uh, lower, uh, down as low as 0.2 molar. And so to give you an idea of the different uh, kinds of proteins, again, our success rate is about 90%. We've had a success with a diverse set of proteins, including bacterial, fungal, and eukaryotic proteins. And these were from different kinds, um, including uh, alpha helicals and beta sheets. So I have another question here. So I'm going to go back one slide. Uh, to the question was, what is the average number of iodide ions found per asymmetric unit? Um, again, uh, those numbers are listed in our paper in terms of the number of iodide ions uh, found in the location step, and then also the numbers that were in the final structure. Um, but to answer the question, on average, we see one iodide ion per 20 amino acids of the scattering mass. Um, so the number of iodides per asymmetric unit is going to depend on the average size of the asymmetric unit. Um, but if we have an average of, say, 300 amino acids in the asymmetric unit, then we get about 15 iodide sites. Um, so again, we've had success with a diverse range of proteins. So we're not just seeing success with one single kind of protein. We're seeing it over quite a range of proteins. This has also been successful across a quite a large range of crystallization conditions where the crystalline was PEG, uh, either you know, 400 up to 8,000, so quite a range there. Um, ammonium sulfate as precipitant, um, isopropanol or sodium chloride as precipitant. We've also seen success across 
quite a range of buffers, uh, and the buffer range spanned 4 to 8.5. So if you look at these conditions, the conglomerate, um, it's fairly reflective of the screens that we're using in crystallography and pretty much commercial screens uh, in general. Uh, now, for the crystal forms themselves, we've seen uh, quite a different range of solvent content uh, from 25% up to 59%. So again, that, that spends the general range for protein crystallography. Uh, we've seen from low symmetry to high symmetry space groups. And for the phasing resolution, again, we've seen 1.9 up to 2.95. Okay, so it works, but why? So why does it work? Uh, well, uh, the first important part is that at high concentrations, iodide ions bind to numerous sites on the surface of proteins. So across our 20 different structures, we've seen over 400 different iodide ion sites. And again, uh, we see one iodide ion per 20 amino acids of the scattering mass. Um, and we've classified these different types of binding sites into uh, numerous categories, which I'll get to on the next few slides. But uh, for this slide, I'm going to continue to stress the key points of why it works. So one question we have is, you know, why, do the, why do your crystals tolerate soaking in high concentrations of ions? Well, um, in our purification expression purification crystallization pipeline, uh, all of our protein samples are purified in at least 0.3 molar sodium chloride. So in a sense, they've already um, been uh, selected to, uh, to be stable in moderate to high sodium, uh, sodium concentration, salt concentrations. And so uh, I suspect that given our pipeline, uh, proteins that do not tolerate moderate salt conditions simply don't make it to crystals. Um, and so I would predict uh, that this method is not going to be um, quite as good for, for proteins that don't tolerate uh, high concentrations of salt. Um, and uh, Angela, who's the moderator, uh, just let me know that more questions are coming in, but we'll probably hold it to the end since I'm running a little behind schedule. Um, and again, another key point is that iodide ions have strong and almost signal in-house, um, and that we observe little or no radiation damage. And of course, one thing that's influential is the high flux of the modern X-ray generators. So if I tried to do the same experiment on the in-house equipment that we had 10 years ago when I started um, a postdoc, you know, where each image took 10 minutes or took 30 minutes to collect and the readout time, you know, doing one of these experiments where you collect 360 degrees of data would have taken 10 days. So it probably just wasn't quite as feasible um, using older equipment, but using the modern equipment. Most of the experiments take you know, an hour or so uh, to overnight at the longest. Of course, uh, I'd also like to give credit to the developers of the computational programs, which uh, nowadays are really quite accurate at identifying sites, um, especially in this case for identifying partially occupied sites. OK, so um, what are the different kinds of iodide ion sites that we see? Uh, of course, one would predict iodide ions, which are negatively charged, binding to positively charged surfaces. Of course, we see plenty of these kinds of um, examples. Uh, we also see binding of iodide ions to hydrophobic pockets. So here off of a couple of proline rings. We also see a category where the amides bind off of, um, where the iodide ions bind off of amide rings, like that shown here. And of course, uh, many of the sites are a combination of different Features. So this site, for example, binds in a uh, hydrophobic pocket that is also next to a um, arginine residue. Uh, sorry, it doesn't didn't come out as well as I thought. Um, in some cases, we've seen iodide uh, generate its own pocket. Um, so if we look at our native structure that we solve after solving the structure by iodide ion we see that in this case, the um, tyrosine residue has adopted a different conformation than we observed in our iodide ion site uh, structure. So it seems likely that the iodine might have um, pushed the tyrosine into a slightly different conformation. So this is, of course, something that you'll be battling with uh, as you do the soaks. 
So if you go to high concentrations and longer times, your crystals will start to uh, degrade in quality, both diffraction quality uh, and um, uh, resolution. And so um, what's probably going on there is the iodide ions are, are binding to the surface of the protein, uh, causing changes in the, the surface of the protein and causing uh, disrupting the packing lattice. So in general, there's several different kinds of sites we've seen. Uh, we've even seen uh, iodide ions bind deep in uh, the active site, even off of compounds that are uh, cofactors, which is FAD. Okay, so now getting into the case studies. Uh, so I'll go through three different case studies. Uh, the first one will be a little more thorough, uh, but in that one, in that case, this is one that worked really well basically the first time. So it gives you an idea of, of how well something can work uh, at each step of the process. And then I'll get into two different ones that were a little more challenging. So in the first case study, we have a putative uncharacterized protein from Mycobacterium smegmatis, 103 amino acids long. Um, Mycobacterium smegmatis is closely related to the tuberculosis version uh, organism. And this ortholog was a ortholog of a community request target, um, RV543C, uh, uh, which is a member of the domain of unknown function family 3349, and the smegmatis and the tuberculosis proteins shared 38% sequence identity. Uh, at first, this was requested, uh, and so we put in smegmatis as a salvation, as a salvage pathway, um, but then we were able to solve an NMR structure of the tuberculosis version. And in short order, we got a two angstrom resolution native data set in-house of the smegmatis protein. However, we were not able to solve that structure by uh, molecular replacement using the NMR structure of the tuberculosis protein. So then we went straight for iodide ion soaking. We had a fairly large crystal to start off with. Uh, it grew in the presence of mag chloride, HEPES buffer, and PEG-400. We soaked it into one molar iodide solution, uh, keeping the magnesium there in case it was important to have divalence versus monovalence. Um, we used uh, the same or nearly the same HEPES buffer and increased the PEG slightly. So we collected a 360-degree data set in-house with one-degree uh, images, eight-second exposure time, a two-theta swing of five degrees, and a detector distance of 50, minute, 50 uh, millimeters. So here's a diffraction pattern. Uh, took about one hour for data collection, and again, this is the equipment that we used. Uh, so then the next step, of course, is to reduce the data, diffract it to just beyond two angstrom resolution. Uh, we originally scaled it into P orthorhombic, so space group P22. Two, uh, and then examine the data in point list to see which is the likely space group. Point list suggested P2 sub 1, 2 sub 1, 2. Um, and so we tried, or so we scaled the data into both that space group 18 as well as the most commonly occurring space group in the, in the PDB, uh, which is P21, 21, 21. Uh, and then we, you, again, you can see that there's a pretty good anomalous signal throughout the data. We then put that into phoenix.hif. Uh, which fails to find any sites in P2 sub 1, 2 sub 1, 2 sub 1, space group 19, uh, but it finds nine sites in P2 sub 1, 2 sub 1, 2. So again, the selection of the appropriate space group was important um, as, as identified by Pointless. And for this experiment, we had a correlation coefficient of 0 0.4, and we got nine sites, uh, most of which had a uh, occupancy above uh, 0.5 or 50%. Uh, then we then put that into phaser EP. And of course, it's very important to check the box for both enantiomorphs. Uh, we got a figure of merit of 0 0.43 overall, then put that output MTZ file into density modification, and then put it straight into Buccaneer while examining the maps. Um, now, Buccaneer was not able to build into the original enantiomorph, because that was wrong. Uh, whereas it was able to build into the other enantiomorph um, and give uh, pretty good RNR free statistics for a first pass built uh, most of both chains of this 103 amino acid protein in about 45 seconds. So at the same time, I was able to examine the um, maps, which I showed earlier, um, and then see how the model was built in. And that was able to give us our structure shown here in electrostatic surface potential. You can see where the iodot ions bind uh, to both positively charged surfaces as well as hydrophobic pockets. 
Uh, and although there's two molecules in the asymmetric unit, the biological molecule is most likely a tetramer. So it's a pretty interesting tetramer where there's a very large hole in the middle. So in this case, everything uh, flowed quite well uh, from start to finish without too many problems. Uh, in, but for a second case, it was a little more challenging. And so that was a HEPHAG-like trimeric autotransporter adhesin from Burkholderia pseudomallei. Uh, this is a community request target. There was nothing like it in the PDB. Uh, and in addition, there were no internal methionines or cysteine residues in the 178 amino acid protein. So it was going to be unlikely that we could use selenomet or, you know, mercury labeling. We obtained a 1.35 angstrom resolution native data set at synchrotron radiation. And uh, then in order to phase this, we took our crystals, which were actually quite small, but diffracted brilliantly, as you'll see in the next slide. And uh, they grow in uh, the packed screen with MIB buffer, which is um, malonate imidazole boric acid buffer um, system. And so we soaked it into basically the same conditions, but with one molar iodide and uh, increased the PEG-1500 to have appropriate crowd protection. Uh, and so here's a diffraction image here. You can see that it diffracts well beyond the detected detector limit at the current um, parameters. Uh, we collected 360-degree data set in-house with quarter-degree images, 10-second exposures, detector distance of 50 millimeters. So this was an overnight data collection um, on our older uh, X-ray equipment. Um, uh, and the data set was just phenomenal. Uh, so as you look at this, it's just an outstanding data set, very complete. The emerging R factor is 2.5% overall, 4% in the last shell. I over sigma is 54% overall, 31 in the last shell. And again, the anomalous correlation is very high, almost 70% overall, with a gamma of, of 2.1 overall. So at this point, you're probably thinking, hey, you're, you're tricking me. This, this one looks like it's a slam dunk. It should be really easy. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, and the reason for that is that the crystals were twinned with an approximate twin fraction of 0 0.2. So of course, the first thing we tried to do was solve the structure. Uh, Phoenix.his could find 10 anomalous sites, and it gave a pretty good figure of merit uh, after running through phaser EP, uh, but the maps were not interpretable and structure solution failed. So at this point, what I tried to do was to collect on a few of the other crystals we had. I collected three total data sets in hopes of getting a uh, data set with a twin fraction that was smaller. So I already knew from the uh, native data set that the twin fraction in the native was 0.1, so I was hoping for a slightly smaller twin fraction that might lead to successful structure determination, uh, but it didn't. Uh, and then Bart Staker, uh, another crystallographer here, suggested limiting the number of sites. And so the key here is to, uh, so that the programs will only pick sites from the, um, the correct solution, and it will avoid picking the stronger sites from the minor twin fraction. So by limiting to either two or four sites, we were able to get uh, essentially the same figure of merit, but we got interpretable maps and were able to solve the structure. Buccaneer was able to build in over 110 residues of the 170 or so amino acid protein, uh, pretty decent refinement statistics. So you can see that the structure shown here, and it's a trimeric protein that's highly intertwined. And so if you look at the monomer uh, shown on the right-hand half of this picture, can see that uh, it's a very interesting structure, and you can see where the iodide ions are shown in there. Uh, they're in purple spheres with the um, anomalous difference Fourier map shown at five sigma there. So again, the key to this one for a twinned data set was to limit the number of sites that the program looked for. Okay, so I'll go now through my last case study and then wrap up the talk here at just about one hour in length. Uh, and this is a putative fructose 1,6-bisphosphate aldolase from a, a fungal target, Coccidioides imitus, which causes valley fever. Uh, so we got a two angstrom resolution native data set at Synchrotron. It was a, a monoclinic data set, and uh, it was not very homologous to many things in the, in the PDB. Our best PDB blast result was from a Giardia fructose 1,6-bisphosphate aldolase, 
that shared 35% sequence identity and 11% gaps, but this was only over about 70% of the size of the protein. So we tried to run molecular replacement, first running chainsaw um, on the Giardia protein and then doing molecular replacement. Uh, we got uh, what is probably a reasonable rotation score. Translation score was not very good and neither was the log likelihood gain. When we tried to refine that, got rather poor refinement statistics with ugly, very model biased maps that were not buildable. So we tried our iodide soaking technique, uh, first trying a two minute soak with 0.5 molar sodium iodide, uh, came up with fairly modest uh, anomalous signal for a, a reasonable data set in house to 2.4 angstrom resolution, fairly weak overall with an I over sigma of, of just over 10. Uh, we were able to then put that into um, Phoenix.his, which was able to locate four sites, but after running Phaser EP, uh, we got fairly low figure of merits, either alone for SAT alone or for combining in the molecular replacement, and these failed to yield interpretable maps. So in this case, the anomalous correlation was 14% overall and 0.9 in the last uh, overall as well for the SIGANO. So uh, at the same time that I'd set up that, I'd left one crystal soaking. And so several days later, I came back and harvested that crystal, collected a 3.1 angstrom data set, had a little more anomalous signal, um, but in the end, again, not very good statistics, and I wasn't able to get interpretable maps. So I tried to increase the iodide concentration up to one molar and did a 15-minute soak instead of two minutes. Got a 2.2 angstrom resolution data set in-house. It's a little bit stronger than the previous data sets to practice a higher resolution. But the key here was that the anomalous signal was much higher. Um, now, even though it was higher, which gave me better figure of merit in SAD, uh, which is about the same with SAD with MR, the maps were still of pretty poor quality. So then I went back and used uh, the trick um, as suggested by Shellex and other people in the literature to cut the resolution limit. In this case, I just cut it back to 2.5 angstrom resolution. Um, again, in this case, the anomalous signal is pretty strong. Uh, Phoenix.his was able to find six sites. Um, the figure of merit for SAT alone was uh, surprisingly low, even lower than the previous one, uh, but gave poor maps. But in this case, I was able to combine in my poor molecular replacement solution, get a figure of merit of 0 0.46 that returned 31 sites and pretty decent quality maps into which Buccaneer was able to build about 80% of the amino acids. It built it across many chains, but it gave me a pretty good starting point. Uh, and again, so this is an analysis of the structure from Coxidioi's images, uh, and so you can see all the different anomalous uh, sites. So iodide ions are shown as magenta, magenta spheres. The maps uh, for anomalous distance foyer are shown at five sigma in magenta mesh. And uh, you can see this overlay of our protein in green with the Giardia protein in gray. Uh, so the RMSD between those two proteins is 1.79. So again, that exceeds the typical limit for success by molecular replacement, which is 1.5 angstrom. Uh, so to recap, uh, structural solution using iodide ions and SAD uh, data collection works really well in-house. Uh, but this is a iterative process, uh, more often than not, with one or more steps needing to be repeated so if at first you don't succeed, keep trying. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, a number of crystallographers who work at SSGCID, uh, as well as all the PIs for SSGCID and the SSGCID team in general. Also like to thank the ALS Collaborative Crystallography team. Uh, they collect quite a number of the SSGCID data sets, including the high resolution native, native data sets of some of the um, structures that we solved using in-house um, iodide ion phasing, and of course I'd like to thank the NIAID for funding. And lastly, I'd like to point out that we have uh, some different links here to SSGCID community request submission. Uh, you can again find all of our raw diffraction images on the CSGID website, and um, then our paper is open access. <laughs>